All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kim Hoff, and I'm going to be presenting on dietary supplements today. Um, my main purpose is to go through and provide information for you all on the types of um, vitamins and supplements that are out there, kind of give you just a little bit of information as what's most important, what does clinical evidence show, what, how can we recommend and um, be a little bit smarter when our patients come to us and ask us questions about these types of things. Um, so first off, just a little bit about myself. Um, I did graduate from St. Louis College of Pharmacy in 2002 and then I went back and got my PharmD at the University of Florida and I graduated there in 2009. And since then, I've become board certified in a couple different areas. Um, I just finished a master's in MTM about two months ago, and I got my certified diabetes education, and I do diabetes education talks as well about once a month. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, if you have any questions, just feel free to go ahead and post them, and I'll either talk to you at the end or maybe address it at that time. Um, So we're going to first talk about regulatory issues with the dietary supplements. We're going to talk about the main types of vitamins that go with each indication, a little bit about efficacy as well as adversities that go, um, and then conclude. So in nourishing our body, basically we can start out, we know, with food, right? So we can have also meal replacements, um, dietary supplements, nutraceuticals, um, prescription strength drugs, over-the-counter drugs. So you might be asking, well, what exactly is a dietary supplement? Well, it could be a vitamin, it can be a mineral, it can be an amino acid, it can be an herb, a phytochemical, any kind of constituent or metabolite that's used to kind of supplement your body. Um, the important thing to think about with dietary supplements is we know in terms of regulatory issues that there's not a lot of um, safety, quality, things of this testing that are done. Um, what is allowed to be placed on the labels and what is needed to be placed on those labels are structural function claims as well as nutrition content. Disease claims, there is no, um, the law does not allow for these particular products to have on them any kinds of prevention, treatment, um, indications at all. Um, it's more of just a wellness, such as this particular vitamin may be able to promote this type of health blah, blah, blah kind of thing. Um, and they have to have an FDA authorization requirement. That statement says that, that this particular claim was not evaluated by the FDA. Um, and that is very important because we know that the Food Drug Administration does not monitor anything with the dietary supplements. In fact, it comes down to the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994. Um, and this particular act, it's important to understand that the proof of safety has to be assumed. The proof of efficacy does not have to be um, instilled at all. As far as the claims that are allowed, as I mentioned, the claims that are allowed to be placed on these vitamins are things such as um, the nutrient content and the structure function. Um, as far as indication, as I mentioned before, and as far as treatment or prevention, that is not allowed to be placed on the product. If it is, the FDA puts the claim there that they are not responsible for the evaluation of this particular product. So that's important to understand. Um, so you may be thinking, well, why use these dietary supplements if they're not really quality proven or safety proven? Well, probably about 18% of Americans, and mostly women, between the ages of 60 and 69 use dietary supplements. And we know that many of the dietary supplements out there are basically just added benefit or um, kind of a replacement a lot of times for things that we don't get in our food. So we know that these substances are also in our foods that we ingest every day and are healthy for us. Um, so it provides basically insurance against poor eating. It helps with genetic vulnerabilities. Um, we also have help with sometimes treatment of certain disease states, um, as well as prevention of certain others and long-term long -term disability. So my purpose today is to kind of go through different my main organization is different indications and in what type of vitamins have been shown either in observational studies or in um, true randomized control studies to be beneficial in that indication. So because of the length and the extensiveness, um, I've cut down 
on what exactly I'm going to talk about with each one of the vitamins. Um, so we're going to focus on basically the indication, the efficacy, and some of the adversities. Um, my slides do contain a little bit more information and I'll be able to touch base on with everyone. So anti-aging, we all want to stay young, right? So papaya, vitamin C, vitamin E, green tea, and reservatol. What I want to focus on here is vitamin E, green tea, and reservatol. First of all, I think it's important to focus on vitamin E. We used to think vitamin E was so safe, so beneficial. And a couple of trials have come out, the GC trial and the HOPE trial, that have actually shown opposite. Um, and these are, these are very, very strong studies. They're randomized control studies, large patient base, typically utilizing about 400 units of vitamin E to try to look at outcomes such as things um, like non-fatal heart attacks, non-fatal strokes. And what they found out was that there was no benefit um, in the prevention of any of these or in the treatment of any of these. And what was found out, ironically, that was in a meta-analysis that took about basically almost 136,000 patients was that ingesting 400 or more actually showed an increase in all-cause mortality as well as um, myocardial infarctions. So now the, there's a lot of controversy over how much vitamin E we need and whether or not it's beneficial. So the main thing I wanted to stress here is anything typically under 400 units or less is considered to be okay. Um, like I said, the trials are mainly were done with 300, 400. Um, so I would say stick with 400 or less and when you're recommending, recommending it. And there's no claims to help with the heart. So those are the things to keep in mind with vitamin E. Green tea. Green tea is wonderful to just drink, just to relax with. Um, there are several studies, about 30 studies, dealing with about 69, 70,000 patients that have shown benefit with things such as cardiovascular health, osteoporosis, cancer. The thing with the green teas is antioxidants. They have products um, or substances in them called polyphenols, which contain pitakin, and that is what is your um, free radical scavenger. So how much green tea do we need? Basically around 250 milligrams daily with mills. There are some things we have to be cautious about with the green tea. That is, sometimes it can you know, elevate the heart rate, cause tremors, but that's just like with anything that's promoting energy. On top of that, Reservatol, which is basically what you see in red wine. This once again contains a lot of antioxidants, and there's been a lot of observational studies. Also done, uh, what they've shown in all the studies that they've done so far is it's able to extend any type of species that was given the Reservatol is able to show that it extended their life. Um, so that's why we get this whole idea that maybe this would be the fountain of youth. Um, I would say that, you know, a glass of wine a night is, if you like red wine, is, can potentially be very beneficial in that aspect. Um, moving along to bone health, the ones I want to focus on here is calcium and vitamin D. And I just want to reiterate, um, the benefit of calcium we know is building up the bone matrix. Um, Calcium alone does not really help with bone fra uh, fractures. It doesn't help with fracture risk. It doesn't help with fall prevention. That's the main point I wanted to stress here. Um, and how much vitamin or how much calcium do we need? Typically, 51 and up, we need 1,200 milligrams in two divided doses. And you're going to absorb the most, usually from your carbonate. But that's like 40%. 21% can be absorbed from the citrate. Um, the main one we want to focus on is vitamin D, and I think we know that vitamin D has been big pushed in the last two or three years um, because of tons of studies and that have shown its benefit in fall prevention. And as a matter of fact, doses of about 700 units or more have shown about over the course of anywhere from 12 months to three years, about a 25% reduction in fall risk reduction. A lot of it depends on what level that you are at with the vitamin D. Um, typically, you want to utilize, when we look at the lab work, they've shown that anywhere between 30 and 60 nanograms per ml is good for both fall prevention as well as fraction risk. So 26 nanograms is usually what you want for fall prevention, 30 nanograms or above to reduce fraction risk. How much is recommended? It depends on what school of thought that you go with. Um, we have that of the Institute of Medicine. We also have the National Osteo process foundation, but typically 800 to 1,000 units daily is what's recommended unless there's a deficiency. Moving into cholesterol, for cholesterol we're going to focus on mainly omegas and the red yeast. I just wanted to put the other ones in there to let you know that they're out there. 
Omega-3, we all know lots of large studies, lots of randomized control studies that are out there showing reductions in total cholesterol, total cholesterol and your triglycerides, as well as heart health. Um, both the American Diabetes Association and the American Heart Association promote fish two times a week. It also promotes about one to two grams per day for heart health and about two to four grams um, per day for triglyceride reduction. So the thing I want to mention here with the omega-3s and the questions that you might get is there's so many different fish oil products out there. The main thing to focus on is that you want omega-3. And you want omega-3 in ratios that are larger than omega-6 and omega-9 because omega-6 and omega-9 are both inflammatory. Um, and omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. So the big push right now is krill oil. Um, if the patient asks you whether or not they should use krill oil versus the others, the thing to, to answer with this is that they're going to pay more money for krill oil. The benefit to krill oil is that the fish oil is actually deposited within the phospholipids. What that basically means is that it helps with synapse connections, it helps with insulation production, um, and it's not just stored as triglycerides or just stored as fat. So sometimes if that's meaningful to a patient, they should pay the extra price. Oftentimes there's not enough absorption of that particular omega that we have to worry about it actually being stored as fat. So you can make your own assessment, your own judgment on that, but give the patients that type of information. That's what I think is important with omega-3s. The red yeast rice, we all know, is the same as basically lovastatin. Um, there is a product called monoclin K, which is basically what lovastatin is. That's the chemical. When it is fermented, it produces citronin. Citronin is what can cause the muscle aches, um, just like you can see in prescription strengths. So we do know that red yeast rice works. The important thing to make sure of is that the patient is not on any other types of things that we know that would interact with lovastatin or even on another statin cholesterol at the same time. Diabetes health. Um, these are the main ones here, aloe, chromium, cinnamon, nicotinamide, and vanadium. I'm going to only focus on chromium and cinnamon because I think these are the two most popular ones that get asked a lot about. When people come to you about chromium, I think it's important to understand that there's very few trials out there that focus solely on just looking at type 2 diabetics or type 1 diabetics and looking at outcomes for reducing blood glucose. And what we've seen in the most recent studies is that there's no benefit, there's no reduction that's statistically significant in blood glucose reductions. The dosages that they'll show you is anywhere from 35 mics for a male to 25 mics for a female. I don't recommend chromium by itself for diabetes management. Um, um, if it's combined in a multivitamin, it's fine, but there's not enough evidence out there to promote it for benefit with diabetes. Cinnamon, once again, I think the important thing to understand here is cinnamon is not of any harm. Um, they looked at studies, and most of the studies that, sh that shown reductions in glucose levels were in patients that were Pakistanians. So I don't know that we can actually extrapolate that information into Americans, but it's mostly Pakistanians, and these patients were also already on glyburide. So we know that sulfonylureas are very good at reducing blood glucose. So separating out cinnamon from the glyburide, does cinnamon really promote a reduction? We're not really sure. But just keep in mind, cinnamon is not harmful unless you're doing what we've seen recently where you ingest it dry, um, which I think we need to get these kids a job to, to get them not doing things such as that. But other than that, cinnamon is not harmful. Now, as far as energy, who couldn't use energy? We all need energy. And the main thing I'm going to focus on here is the vitamin Bs. But I want you to be aware that the other ones here do have some either observational trials or some indications that can benefit in energy. Vitamin Bs, we know for sure, work. Um, there's B1, which is fine, and it helps with the, helps with the basically absor absorption and ingestion of carbohydrates. B2 is riboflavin. It helps with basically the utilization of both protein and carbohydrates. B3 is nice, and it helps in mental functioning. Um, the two that I think are most important is B6. Actually, there's three that's most important. B5, B6, and B12. B5 is actually panthenic acid, and it's very beneficial for adrenal hormone production which is our stress, is basically our stress gland. Um, and vitamin B6 is very beneficial as a precursor in making things such as serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And we know how important those chemicals are in every reaction in our body. B12 is very beneficial for nerve production and cognition. The, the, the observational studies, they don't, they don't have really any studies that they've shown um, per se where there's a direct link between a reduction in vitamin B12 and memory impairment that's statistically significant, but they've shown in almost 70% of observational studies that 
there is a link between cognition decline and B12 reduction. So I think, you know, and of course we know that the bees are not going to be of any harm, so I think promoting B12 or even the B complex is very beneficial. Moving into gastrointestinal health, the two that I'm going to focus on here is ginger and probiotics. There's a lot of big word on the probiotics, um, and we all know that psyllium and fiber helps sweep out our system, keep our systems moving. First off, talking about ginger, ginger has been shown in a couple studies, 21 studies in about 3,000 patients or so, to be very beneficial in basically post-operative nausea, um, as well as motion sickness. Um, and basically, ginger in dosages of about 100 milligrams of the extract, in the rhizomes or the roots, usually about two to four grams daily. Um, it's been shown to be comparable to prescription strength metoclopramide for post-operative. And they're still looking into other reviews for pregnant women and chemotherapy-induced nausea. Probiotics, um, I wanted to touch base because there's so much information on probiotics right now. The main species to look at when you look at a product is Saccharomyces boulardia. Um, lactobacillus, and also um, bifidium. Now, there's different, we can separate out what types of indications these particular probiotics are for. There's lots of evidence and benefit behind things such as irritable bowel syndrome, um, acute viral diarrhea, also antibiotic-associated diarrhea, um, gastroenteritis, and there's some evidence on things like ulcerative colitis, um, H. pylori, and very little on things like Crohn's or lactose intolerance or colorectal cancer. What I'm trying to point out here is which species do you really want if the patient is complaining of certain symptoms. So if they come to you and they have just a viral diarrhea, you want mainly to focus on lactobacillus and saccharomyces. If it's an antibiotic-associated diarrhea, the same type of species. Once you start to get into ulcerative colitis, um, and more irritable bowel where you're dealing with more sections of the intestines, then we look into more of the anaerobic type of species, which is the bifidium. What do we know is too much or too little? Because um, you look at the cultures on the back of these and some of them say, you know, three times as many cultures as others. The bottom line is greater than 100 million, less than 10 billion. That's what the Mayo Clinic recommends. And a lot of this is all based on manufacturer recommendations as well. As far as adversities, there have been a couple case reports about mine that have looked at um, an increase in invasive fungal infections and the usage of saccharomyces. I think that the bottom line that we have to keep in mind is that if your immune system is already suppressed, a lot of times that's going to heighten, of course, the adversities of fungal infections. Now with heart health, these are the three that are mainly out there for indications for this, as well as alpha glycolic acid. I want to focus a little bit on coenzyme Q10 because I think there's a lot of in fact, there's a new trial out now called the Simpico trial that is actually looking at um, coenzyme Q10 in patients with, basically, we're looking at myocardial infarction and heart failure benefits because that's where the studies so far have led people to see benefit with coenzyme Q10. Um, in hypertension, so reductions in both systolic and diastolic blood pressures, um, as well as in congestive heart failure where we've seen reductions in hospitalizations and edema. So you might be saying, well, how much do we need? Typically anywhere between 100 to 225 milligrams daily um, is what we're looking at. And that study is still going on right now. So once the, the word comes out with that, I think um, we'll really know more about coenzyme and it might be a bigger pitch for that. Immune production. Um, the thing I want to focus on here is vitamin C, echinacea, and zinc. Um, vitamin C is very important in terms of your immune system, things like the natural killer cell production, also in chemotaxis, and basically in lymphocyte proliferation. So that's how it works clinically in the immune system. What studies have shown basically is that it helps to reduce the symptom severity as well as the duration of symptoms. There really hasn't been any trials that have actually shown full proof that this can prevent um, infections. But it can reduce the symptom severity as well as the um, duration of that illness. And how much? Typically, for males, they usually say 90 milligrams. For women, they usually 75 milligrams. 60 milligrams tends to be enough to basically prevent deficiency. Um, if you're using vitamin C for stress reduction, it helps with the basically the adrenal gland. Um, and you can get anywhere between 1 to 3 grams of vitamin C per day to help with stress reduction. The big thing you have to watch for here is diarrhea, 
Um, and you may get buildup of vitamin C can cause kidney toxicity if you're using excessive amounts over long periods of time. I bring up echinacea mainly because I want to show you that even though there is a lot of information out there about echinacea being beneficial, the main thing that echinacea does is it helps more viral infections than it does bacterial infections. They've shown clinically what it actually works on is interferon. Interferon is a type of um, cytokine in our immune system that's very important in viral infections. So there's been 21 studies that looked at about 3,500 patients and shown benefits in respiratory tract infections um, and in gestational safety with infections. Um, I would say I don't recommend echinacea on its own just for the prevention of infection. I believe vitamin C and zinc will take care of that. There's just not a lot of evidence out there for echinacea unless we know for sure that it's a viral infection um, and not a bacterial infection. So with the zinc, the zinc is actually shown in patients between the ages of 19 and 40 years of age to be beneficial at about dosages of about 40 milligrams and nothing more than that for reductions in cold sores, influenza, colds. Zinc is very important in about 300 different enzymatic reactions within the immune system. It helps to proliferate your white blood cells and that's all kinds. So neutrophils, um, basophils, um, macrophages, the ones that are first on the site. So that's why zinc is very beneficial for prevention of um, colds and infections. Just make sure that we're not promoting any more than typically 40 milligrams because it can also cause depletions in iron and copper. Moving on to men's health. Men's health, I'm actually going to discuss every one of these in men's health because I think this is a, there's a lot of information out there on men's health and in each one of these products. The main one that's been studied, of course, the most is salt palmetto. Um, and there's been about 30 randomized control styles that show a lot of superiority, basically in the outcome of reducing urination overnight, um, as well as reducing residual volume. Um, basically, how much do you need of salt palmetto? They look at about 320 milligrams a day. Um, and it's very well tolerated. So, um, if a man is coming to you, has mild symptoms after you've done assessment with BPH, is looking for something over the counter, I do recommend salt palmetto. Betacetyrol is an actual antiproliferative agent, which means that it's mainly antioxidant. Um, the outcomes that have been shown to be beneficial in, once again, is reducing urinary flow and decreasing the urinary residuals. And it's at doses of 60 to 130 milligrams. The main thing you have to worry about here is potentially a little bit of diarrhea. L-arginine is not one that I would recommend, but it is out there and men like this because of the, basically the bottom line is for erectile dysfunctions. Um, they've looked at it and studied it up to as much as 5 grams a day. It's very similar to the nitric oxide pathway, which is basically shunting all the blood flow into the penile area for erection. Um, but they've seen also benefits in 1.7 grams with 40 milligrams of what they call pycongenial. Um, but I do not recommend this. This can be very harmful because we can have a lot of hypotensive attacks. It can also cause abdominal bloating and some gout. Selenium. Selenium, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the prostate study about looking at a type of mixture of vitamins and minerals to help with prostate prevention, which is called the SELECT trial. What they found out in the um, SELECT trial was that actually selenium in doses of about 200 mics showed 63% reduction in prostate cancer, okay, in about 1,000 men. Um, the thing that we want to be cautious about, though, is that in the combination that they were using the selenium with, which was beta keratin, which I will talk about next, it actually showed an increased risk in advanced prostate cancer. So um, there's a lot of controversy over whether or not to recommend selenium for the basic prevention of prostate cancer. Um, and keep in mind that if we get too much selenium, which is over 400 mics, we can start to break down a lot of hail, hair and nail, as well as muscle wasting. So it, it interrupts basically protein synthesis at that point. Beta keratin is vitamin A. We don't really need any more than about 15 milligrams a day of vitamin A. Um, what the study that was done here was there was about 22,000 male physicians that were given 50 milligrams every other day. And there was also a, another trial that looked at about almost 300,000 men, um, giving them the same amount, and it showed basically an increase in advanced prostate cancer. 
So once again, and we also know that there's an increased risk of lung cancer in smokers that use vitamin A. So we steer, steer, steer clear of vitamin A alone for any of these type of indications. And that can put anybody in a bad mood. So what can we use to, to help with mood? Um, these are all the things that are out there to benefit with mood. But the one thing I really want to focus on mainly is St. John's War. You should probably have a lot of patients that will come up and ask questions about this. This has been shown in trials to be basically what we would consider comparable or non-inferior to other antidepressants, such as um, fluoxetine and sertraline. Um, tons of studies, about 27 studies, 3,000 patients, have shown basically that it has been statistically significant in improving basically the signs and symptoms of depression as compared to placebo, and then it's, as I said, it's been considered non-inferiable or comparable to sertraline and fluoxetine. How much do we need? About 300 to 600 milligrams. We can go up to about three times a day. The one thing I want to focus on here is what kinds of adversities could you see from this? Sunlight sensitivity, and if they're taking this in conjunction with other antidepressants um, or other mood stabilizers, we have to watch out for serotonin syndrome as well. Ocular health, the thing I want to focus on here is the odds. The ARDS trial and the ARDS 2 trial, and a little bit on cataracts and what some of the studies show here. The combination, we're going to talk about vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, lutein, xanthine, and zinc. In the ARDS trial, this trial was actually looking at reduction for age-related macular degeneration. 400 units of vitamin E, 500 units or 500 milligrams of vitamin C. Um, I believe it was 80 milligrams of zinc oxide, 15 milligrams of beta keratin. And they were looking to see if there was a reduction in the production or progression of age-related macular degeneration. And they found out that there was indeed a 25 milligram, or, I'm sorry, 25% reduction. Um, the ARDS-2 trial actually focuses on adding lutein and xanthine. And that's what I want to focus on next. Um, this looks at basically 5.8 milligrams per day of those two products showed a 57% reduction in macular degeneration. They've looked at 10 milligrams of this in one year, for over one year, and it showed improvement actually in vision, which is very, very important because a lot of times with macular degeneration, the vision loss is irre irreversible. So by looking at up to 10 milligrams of lutein in these products, and these patients taking this for about a year, and seeing vision improvement, or at least not any regression, is very beneficial. So they recommend about 6 to 10 milligrams of um, lutein and xenothene per day for age-related macular degeneration reduction, and about 15 milligrams three times a week for um, cataracts. Now the pain, I just have two more that we're going to talk about. That's going to be pain and women's health. The main thing I want to focus with pain, you might be getting questions about turmeric or boswellia. Um, right now, there's not a whole lot of evidence out there for that um, particular substance. Um, however, I would say, I, I'll show you the resources that I have. You can go to those resources and do a little bit of research yourself and look at the studies. Some of them are shown not to be as beneficial as things like non and ibuprofen. So you can kind of make your own judgment when you go to some of the sources that I'll bring up towards the end. But we all know for sure glucosamine and chondroitin, and lots of trials have shown to be benefit. And the bottom line here is we put these two together in combination. Um, typically, double strength is just enough, but you don't need the triple strength. You don't need to recommend the triple strength. The double strength is fine. So that would be 1,500 milligrams, basically, of glucosamine, and about 1200, 800 to 1,200 milligrams of chondroitin. We know that by combining these two together, we are helping to basically increase the aggregate that's in your cartilage area, which helps with the shock absorption of the cartilage. Um, we also know that the glucosamine itself can help with protoglycan synthesis. So what some of the research societies have shown is basically that in combination together, glucosamine and chondroitin is considered a lot of times to be the second most effective therapy for osteoarthritis. Um, and mainly, a lot of these studies I wanted to focus on is mainly done in the Okay, not in hip, not in spine, but mostly in knee. So both glucosamine and chondroitin. The thing that I want to point out, as far as adversities and things to be cautious about, with chondroitin there's not a lot except for nausea. With glucosamine we have to watch out for shellfish allergies. Um, we also have to, to watch out for um, dropping blood glucoses a lot of times. 
Um, it can drop blood glucose. It can also um, create a little, of course, intestinal adversities. Um, but the main thing, like I said, is watch out in diabetics. If they're on glyburide, a lot of times this, in addition to the glyburide, can cause kind of low sugar levels. So I just caution patients when they're using this to kind of monitor it when they first start to see where it affects them and how it affects them. So the last topic then is on women's health. All of these are out there on the, on the market right now claiming or indicating for women's health. What I really want to focus on though, and I think you're going to get a lot of questions about, is the black cohosh and the phytoestrogen products. So what do we know? What's the evidence out there on black cohosh? Well, looking at some of the randomized um, control styles, control trials, we looked at basically 40 milligrams of black cohosh as compared to your conjugated estrogen products of about 0.625. And what we're looking at is the menopause rating scale, which if any of you pulled that up and looked at it, it's mainly hot flashes, irritability, night sweats, vaginal atrophy. So the whole gamut is kind of looking at that. They showed no statistical significance in that. There was another trial that was called the Herbal Alternatives Menopause Trial, which is the HALT trial. It compared 160 milligrams of um, black cohosh with the conjugated estrogens. And once again, it mainly focused on hot flash reduction, and it didn't show any statistically significance in the symptom relief on that. The thing to keep in mind with black cohosh is that there's still risk of hepatotoxicity, there's still risk of breast cancer. Um, so I do not recommend black cohosh um, without a physician's approval. If some woman comes to me and says they're experiencing night sweats, um, typically I tell them natural products, which we'll talk about a little bit with soy, um, which I'll talk about when I discuss phytoestrogens, um, and also discussing things such as venlafaxine, citalopram, things of that nature. And also, we can always focus on things that are um, not taken by mouth, such as the patches or even the vaginal um, applications of, of estrogen and um, progesterone replacement. So the phytoestrogens, there are three types. They're basically the isoflavones, um, the litigans, and the coumatins. The ones that have been studied the most is the soy products, which is in the isoflavin. Um, and basically, they have shown statistical significance in hot flash incident reduction. Um, and mainly, though, what I want to focus on here is that most of the things that they focus on is hot flash reduction, not the vaginal atrophy or not the vaginal dryness or not the mood instability or irritability but mainly the hot flashes, okay? Um, and that's where they've shown statistical significance. We also can look at things um, such as the flaxseed oil that's shown some reduction as well, 35% in hot flash, 40% in night sweats. Um, so once again, I think, you know, when a patient or woman comes to you and asks about products over the counter, we always have to assess their age, we have to assess their, their risks that they already are experiencing or having or potential um, as well as the benefits and the products that they've tried already, um, and if they're on anything um, by mouth prescription strength before we can make a judgment. So in conclusion then, I hope today that I've kind of given you a brief overview of some of the main dietary supplements that are basically the most popular and you get most of the questions about. Hopefully I've presented enough to where you can see whether the evidence sways you towards one way or the other. Gives you a clear indication. Um, and the bottom line is to kind of help these patients themselves be a little bit smarter and be a smarter consumer and be a little bit more educated themselves because if we can start educating them on, you know, what to look for, what, what's on these products, um, the quality of these products, um, how they're regulated, um, different things of that nature, I think we can, we can create a, a society that's a little bit more educated about this. And I think the bottom line as well is to make sure that we're choosing the right supplements for the right patients, which would be the most optimal, and also to understand that most everything that's out there can be ingested through the food. So unless someone is just really unable to maintain a normal, healthy diet um, or have deficiencies in certain areas, all the things for the most part that I have discussed is in the food that we eat. Now the references that I use a lot for this, um, one is done by an author known as Laura Shane Water. And she has done extensive amounts of information on vitamins for diabetes. Um, the other is your American Botanical Council um, and your quick professional guide to herbs, um, supplements, and integrated medicine.
There are also lots of information out here for resources for um, healthcare professionals as well as just advocates and consumers. And that's kind of what this um, page talks about. These, there's the Office of Dietary Supplement Fact Sheets, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine Fact Sheets. These are great to, to give to your consumers, to give to your patients, um, and they can kind of make their own judgment a lot of times. Um, a lot of times these patients that are coming to you are educated themselves. And so they're looking for you to help them, giving them a recommendation, or even just steer them in the right way where they can do their own reading and kind of make their own decision on what is good for them or not. So I open it up now for, I guess, any questions that you have um, or any comments, concerns, and I will address those. Thank you. All right, thank you all.